Hey guys, welcome to episode three of Between the Lanes. I'm Ralph, and that's Eclipse Ron. All right, let's get started. All right, let's get started here. We got them all lined up. We got eight cars on the line. Power's coming on here, and the green flag's waving. First things first, we want to clean up a few things from last week. Ron, what you got? Well, last week I incorrectly called the um, road course at Eddie Wong's Raceway in Vallejo, California, the Purple Angel. It's actually called the Mother Load, and I knew that, but I got called in on it. So Purple Angel is uh, at Fast Tracks, and the Mother Load is at Eddie Wong's. So those are two, road, two more road courses in Northern California. Okay. All right. So we'll move into a couple of race, uh, a couple of races we had last weekend. The Columbus Enduro at Tom Thumb Hobbies. The uh, first place team was Team RGO, and that consisted of Rick Bernardo Jr., Will Custer, and Steve Kepp. Second place was Team Big Three, and that had Mike Raisin Garrett, Nelson Swanberg, and Diana Dykeman. Third place team was Team Tom Thumb, and that consisted of Justin Porter, Josh Crutchfield, and Jessica McMasters. And well, and before we go on, I, I want to give a shout out to team number four, which was team Grizzly. And that was Paul Martin and Butch Dunaway and Eric Beliki, Eric Beliki. And um, they were actually in third going in the last heat. And I don't really know what happened last heat, but they weren't on the track when power came on. And they kind of went from a solid third to fourth. And that moved up uh, Tom Thumb. But, but the race, I mean, the, the race was kind of interesting. I didn't watch the whole thing. I just kind of tuned in on parts. But it swapped back and forth between Team RGO and the Big Three, and then I really don't know what happened to Big Three. I know that I know that uh, Team RGO had to swap motors a couple times, and they had a rider and had a little damage, but they were pretty dominant other than that stuff. So, Okay. Congratulations to them. You yep. know, anytime you just finish that race, it's, it's an accomplishment. You know, six hours around that track is – is pretty grueling. Well, I think you finish in the top two or three is a major accomplishment with yeah. no track calls, no, no uh, the only time power is off for lane changes. So right. um, other than that, it's all green, pit stops. Uh, not even, not even, it doesn't even shut off for a rider. No, no rider calls. It's, it's power's full on the whole time. So yep. then up in New Jersey, Mount Holly, New Jersey at speed zone, they held the third annual Jay Kissing Memorial race. And it's hard to believe Jay's been gone three years already. Yeah, very hard. But they ran two of Jay's favorite classes. Um, Jay loved to run retro F1 cars and wedge-style body uh, LMP flexi cars. So yeah. they run Jay's two favorite classes in his honor. And Matt Bruce swept both those races. Okay. And and I, I know that Adam Chaya got second in F1, but I don't know anything else uh, as far as I didn't see. I didn't see a full report. If they give us a full report, we'll let you guys know next week for sure. Yep. And Ron, you have some results from the Division One USRA Nats, right? Yep. Uh, yep. The the 2017 version of the USRA Wing Car Nats took place. Uh, started last Wednesday. Finished on Sunday. Um. In the Group F race, uh, Roy Lavanos or Lavanos, I don't know what the pronunciation of the name is, but he was your winner. Jason Holmes was second, and Chris Cross was third. In the One Motor Box race, which was probably the best race of the week because the top four guys were within a lap at the end of that one, it was Richard Canute with uh, 338, uh, Jason Hooper second 338, a few sections behind Richard. Then he had Esteban with 397. And Paul Goronsky, 397, a few sections back behind uh, Esteban. And then 27 light, uh, I, I believe they had 25 entries. I think that was the largest class of the week. Uh, Buford, uh, Paul Pedersen was your champion. Uh, Jason Hooper second, Paul Goronsky third. Uh, two motor open had Buf winning again with Doug Bauer of Port Jeff Raceway in New York. Uh, second, and Paul Goronsky, third again. And then the final and the big show of the week was Sunday, Group 7. Uh, Buf again won another USRA, you know, Group 7 National Championship title. Timmy Skirka was second, and Joe Salzman, or a.k.a. Chubby, was third. So 
uh, Chubby and, and Timmy, both out of Port Jeff Raceway as well. So, Congratulations to all those guys. <laughs> in, in next week's show, we will go a little bit more depth into uh, the USRA and the Nats and a few other USRA items that will probably be of interest to many. So, Okay. And I believe we've got a couple upcoming races that I know of. One of them is the Rebel Series race at the slot car track in Concord, which is owned by Randy McNulty. And I think there's going to be a retro race up in your area, right? Yeah, this weekend is the uh, Lee Watson BRS Retro Memorial Can-Am race. So it's, it's the first uh, race of the series, the 2017-2018 series. And um, going to be racing Retro Angle Winders, Can-Am, F1, and then FNRS GTP. And okay. that's going to serve as a, a kind of a warm-up race for the locals and whoever else is there for the F, FNRS race that's coming up their October uh, at Tri-State Raceway in Middletown, Ohio. Okay. Well, guys, as promised, uh, we told you we'd work really hard on getting a special guest on the show, and we were able to do that this week. And here he is. Who's seen? John Miller, owner of Pro Slot. Hey, John, how you doing? Good. How are you guys doing today? John, live and in the house. <laughs> we're good, John. First of all, thank you for uh, coming on with us. We appreciate taking your time out of your day and talking with us and all the viewers. I know there's a lot of people that are going to be excited to hear what you have to say. And I know I've known you for several years. I consider you a good friend, but there's a lot of people out there listening that have never had the opportunity to meet you. Um, pretty much everybody's done business or, or bought a pro slide item from their raceway at some point. So why don't you start out by just telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got into slot car racing. Sure, great. Um, you know, I started slot car racing when I was you know, very young. My father for Christmas bought my brother and I, uh, it was T-Jet, a T-Jet model motoring set made by Aurora. Um, I forget the exact model, but it was just the standard model that came out back then. And we started racing when I was about five years old. And I remember that Christmas that my brother and I didn't get much track time. It was my dad and my uncles that really spent most of the time racing on the track. And after we finally got our hands on the track, we raced it incessantly. We, we become slot car heads pretty early on. And oddly enough, where I lived, um, you could see from our front porch, you could see a hobby shop that was literally about a block and a half away. And at an early age, my mother would, you know, give me money I would, that I would earn around the house from doing chores. And I could walk up to the hobby shop and go buy parts for my T-Jet cars. Well, they had a, also had a 124 scale track in there. And at nine years old, my dad took me up there and got me involved with competitive racing and um, started running on the 24 scale track. And back then, we ran GEs. And you would take the old dynamic, literally pop metal chassis, and you would hang bat pants on them. And we run those old GE motors. Um, and I think back then the tires were gray or black. There was different tires you could get, but they weren't like the high tack compounds you get now. No fish rubber really. It was, that's right. What it was. And we, I ran those until probably we ran GEs there until about 1970, probably around 72, maybe yeah, around there. No, I'm on my turn. About 1976. Market dried up. We started running lot bombs at that track. Okay, so back to the GE cars and yeah. your. I take it they were foam tires. They were foams. Okay. Yeah. So no silicones. Did you race? Did you race spray glue or glue or wintergreen oil or? No, we would. There was. They would. They would put a few dots of glue on the track and let it run in. That was it. You couldn't add any glue. And the tires that were used back then, there were these old Riggins tires. Okay. Some of them were orange. That was preferred. We'd run those. You could use wintergreen oil on them, and that'd be about it. Or you could get a bottle of glue and put a couple of drops of glue on your tires and rub it in, but there was no no glue adding throughout the day throughout, during the race. They would put a couple of dots down, we'd run that in, and they would rarely clean the track because there were so many kids running on it every day. The track was always clean. And had rough, it was, just had rubber or glue on it all the time. So I, I did that um, at, around, at nine years old, and I hung around the hobby shop so much that the owner one day, he said, you know, you're here so much. He goes, I'm just going to hire you. I'll pay you 35 cents an hour. Um, you can, you've got a 
drill the pot machine, you got to sell the potato chips, and you got to sell track time. So nine years old, right that same year, I started working at the track. Um, every Saturday, that was my job. And I, my other job was to offload the truck when it would come in on a Saturday. A lot of stuff was coming out of Chicago. This is back when trains started to decline, and they were buying, this guy was buying out all the hobby shops that were shutting down in the Chicago area and just buying just truckloads of train equipment, and I would just store those. Um, I, did, I worked there until I was around 12 or 13 years old, and that's when the Blue King moved in to the town where I'm at. And uh, Ray Burnley opened that up, a place called Phantom Raceway. I started working with Ray, and Ray was making, at that time, was we were starting to make some wing cars, and then Ray was dabbling in making motors, and started doing some slot car stuff on the manufacturing side. Um, did that for a couple of years, and shortly after that, that's when um, Ray Burnley started to talk to Dan Bella of Pro Slot. Dan relocated Pro Slot to Hartford, Michigan. You know, I want to say, Ron and I, we've talked about this before, you know, 81? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it was 81, because the first time I went to Hartford was in 82, and Pro Slot was already there in, you know, in the back of the building, back in the room behind the raceway in the little pit area room there. So Dan was already, Dan and Pro Slot was already there. Yeah. By, 80, by 82, so... Yeah, so it was about 81, uh, I remember when Dan moved to, uh, to Michigan, I, I helped offload the truck because I was already working there. Um, so it just naturally progressed that I started working with ProSop when he first relocated to Michigan. And back then, primarily, I, I mean, I made a lot of, uh, a lot of Group 15 chassis, um, wound uh, motors, made, made setups, um, lead wire, anything that needed to be done in the shop um, that didn't take... Dan did all the precision hand winding of all the open motor stuff, the Group 27s. Um, Ray, that was right at the beginning when they started doing hex motors and things, yeah. So many box stock chassis do you think you soldered together when you were there? At least 5,000. <laughs> at, at least, yeah. We had, at one time, we had four high school kids there. Every day after school and on Saturdays, we were knocking out chassis every day. And in the summer, full time, we would, we would build up stock for sale all the time. It was four kids round the clock making chassis. Well, and because Ralph probably doesn't know what we're talking about, but but Pro Slot back then was the first company to make the ready to run box stock 15 car, which in a short time became a huge class regionally. And then, you know, like they started racing that class, in, I think 84. And by 1987, it had been added to the national USRE national. So it became a class. So, Pro Slot was the first and is the one who started the whole box stock class deal, basically, and then the rest is history. Yep. I remember we would offload cases of just, we would did the B078 single main rail, and we would bring in, you know, they would come in the tubes from KNS, but we would bring in the full big boxes of each size wire for that car. We would buy a case of wire at a time. The amount of wire we were bundling and cutting, it was. That's what, what we did. It was fun, and everyone was excited about it. You know, it was, it was everyone was passionate about doing it. I mean, including the, you know Dan and Ray Burnley both. They were just, in my opinion, the hobby at that time. There was so much activity going on. A lot of races. You go to a race, and there'd be, I mean, you know, 50, 60 guys showing up to play. It was incredible, and it was across the country. And in comparison, I don't know how many tracks there are then as compared to now. Ron, do you have any ideas? How many commercial races were back in the 80s? Well, back then, oh, in the early 80s, how many tracks were there? There was probably only 100 or so. I mean, that was 80, 82, 83 was kind of the start of the second cycle of slot car racing growing. So I'm going to say by 83, 84, there was probably 125 to 130 raceways. So There was a lot of activity. We had a lot of fun doing that. So I mean, I worked with Pro Slot right up until when you know Dan and Ray Burn Dan developed Ray Burnley, they, they separated and Dan relocated the business to Lowell, Michigan. And I followed that up to I followed Dan up to Grand Rapids. I lived up in Grand Rapids for a couple of years, or actually Lowell, Michigan, where the business relocated. So what year what year would you say the final year was that you were uh, working with Dan and Pro Slot? Nineteen eighty six. Eighty six. Okay. So from 1986 to 2017, big gap here. So 
did you kind of move away from the hobby or did you stay engaged or were you coming and going or, or what, what did you do in those years? Well, uh, I stayed engaged. Um, I, uh, what I did, not necessarily, it went from 124 scale and after I left Dan in 86, I started, I jumped right into the RC industry. And I used to buy Yokomo teardowns and buy Trinity teardowns. And I would hand wind RC armatures. I had all the equipment to do that. I had a, a you know, balancer, welder, everything I needed to make, to assemble a complete teardown. Um, and I did that from 86, roughly, you know, around there, probably, you know, 87 to uh, I think around 1992 is when I got out. Um, okay. I did that for that many years. And that's, and I, at that time, what I did, I would literally make, I made all of uh, Trinity's, I was one of the guys that Trinity used to make all the, uh, the hand-wound team stuff. And everything was all hand-wound specialized motors for, you know, racers throughout the country. And I literally traveled around the United States, you know, racing and making motors for RC car guys. And those races, when we'd go, without exaggeration, there'd be, not entries, there'd be 300 people, separate people at each of those races. It was insane. Yeah, because RC racers always have sign-ups. You know, 300, 400 is the maximum number, and they would always book up. I mean, if you was yeah. 401 of 400 entry race, you weren't getting into race. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. So I, did that. Yep. I, did, I did that until 92. Um, and then I, I got out of that, and I went back to uh, – Went to college, finished my college degree, and then I started my careers in just mainstream work. I, oddly enough, you know, a lot of people don't know this about me. I was around here. We call it uh, tribal chairman. I was the leader of a sovereign Native American nation. I'm Native American. I was a leader of a sovereign Native American nation for 11 years. That's what I did. I helped uh, develop a tribal nation. That's that was a lot of fun. Very challenging. Um, I got out of that, and I, then I went to managing an architecture and engineering firm. Um, did some consult consulting, did that for six years, and then right around that time is when Dan and I, we remained friends. You know, we had talked about, you know, probably for the last five years, Dan was, you know, John, one day I'd like to know if you want to buy this company from me. We kicked it around, and so eventually we, we made an arrangement, and Dan called me up one day, and he says, you know, John, I'm 67 now. I don't want to work past 68. He goes, I'm ready to sell it. So we sat down, worked in earnest. I wrote a business plan. I went to a you know, lending institution, um, brought in a couple of consultants on a small business level, and you know, finished everything up and bought a building, um, renovated it um, during the time when we bought it, November um, 18th of 2016. And at that time when we bought the building, it took us time to renovate it and get the new location ready for operations to relocate them. And uh, that took a few months, and we moved, relocated April 18th of 2017. So for those few months there, I, Dan mentored, Dan and Cheryl mentored my wife and I. It took me some time to get back up to speed because I hadn't manufactured, you know, slot cars in decades, uh, but still did race slot cars over the time. Uh, when my kids were younger, I, I jumped into HO scale for a while, so I did that out of the basement. Um, won a national championship, I think, in 2009 doing that. I had a lot of fun with racing with the HO guys. And after uh, the kids got older and I could travel more, that's when I jumped right back into 124 scale. And now I'm here owning Pro Slot, and I love running around racing with you guys. So, so basically you've been involved with Pro Slot on and off and still racing your, with yourself and your family since the 80s. So – You've been around, you've seen a couple different cycles of the hobby come and go. So, obviously, you saw enough in pro slot in the industry to take the jump and say, I want to make a big investment um, with my time and financially to be involved in this. So, how do you feel, uh, basically, the state of the hobby? I mean, how do you see slot car racing now in 2017 and, and moving forward? I mean, currently, you know, as of today, um, you know, I see it, I see it very stable. Uh, when, you know, I sat down with several consultants before we acquired ProSlot and we looked at, you know, the cash flow sheets that ProSlot had and it had been cash flowing for, for 40 years. That's how long Dan was, you know, he owned ProSlot for. And it, it, it looked very stable. Um, 
you know, I didn't run a full pro forma, but we did do some research and we, from what we see, I mean, I, I want to, I'm going to retire probably in around, I'm 52, probably going to retire in 15 years. Um, for at least for that 15 to a 20 year period, we see a very stable um, market for this hobby. From what we looked at, I brought in consultants to look at that, and they don't see that change in the demographic of what we have currently, and there is new life coming into it. Um, they, they see it continue to thrive for you know, at least as long as I want to do it, and probably Ralphie, you're a little younger than me, as long as you want to do it. Right. You know, I'm a firm believer the world's what you make it, and that's why you know, ProSlot's been doing its best to invest in new products and coming out with just new things that may be some things that are very simple, you know, like a quad magnet or a new motor brush or you know, maybe a new, a new armature or a, a, a new commutator. But those things keep the keep people involved. They keep them interested, and it just adds to its the, the, the business overall, the industry doing well. So I, I, I look at it, maybe looking at it through rose-colored glasses, but I see a very, very positive hobby, very positive industry. Sorry, eclipse glasses. <laughs> Well, you know, I know you read online, you know, there's always a lot of, a lot of doom and gloom about our hobby. Um, so, Good. You mean like on social sites or somewhere else? Yeah. Well, yeah, a little, little bit of both. Okay. Um, well, I mean, not everybody, not everybody, but there are a lot of people that kind of forecast doom and gloom. Our hobby's dying. It's not what it, and, and granted, no, it's not what it once was in the 60s. I and mean, we all know that. There's no argument there. Um, and it probably never will be, but you know, there's still enough here. You know, the three of us are manufacturers, and we we are all able to see enough in it to um, want to invest our time in it, and it sustains our living. And you know, I know, I know both of you and myself are all real passionate um, about racing, about the hobby, and it's just nice to see somebody else with a with a positive outlook. And, you know, I, I don't think you got rose colored glasses on, like you said, you know, so. You know, the, one of the things that I wanted to add is, you know, in this perspective, I think we all share is when we do see those things, I, I read them, you know, there is doom and gloom and some negative things on social sites or whatever that may be. That's really the only, where we're, only place we're really getting that. I don't really get that vibe when I go to races and engage no. the but you know what we do, I mean, we're selling internationally as well, so it's not just the United States. A lot of the social sites where we're engaging, those are you know, a lot of folks from the United States. And there's a, there's always a few. It's one of those things where it's the eighty twenty rule, right? There's going to be twenty percent of people that are going to be very negative. That's going to really try to color it. That's really negative. That's in a in a bad light. Um, but from an international standpoint, our sales are great. I mean, when when we go into our summer and all the part of the world's going into their winter and they're in their you know, late winter right now, we see, we see very strong sales in other parts of the world. I'm sure you guys do too. So right. not, it's not just us and just in the United States, but we see global sales. So that's, yeah. why, that's why I'm so positive about it because I see people doing it all over the world. And, you know, United States is just one small portion of it. The other, there's other portions of the world where, you know, scale racing and auto racing or Formula One racing, they're so passionate about that. That's their sport. In the United States, we may see that maybe certain things may decline with, say, NASCAR, and it may affect someone's point of view with a hobby industry on slot cars. Right. I know, I know my business, you mentioned the summertime, um, you do a lot of international business. I know for me, I particularly ship a lot of stuff to places like New Zealand, uh, Sweden, Norway, Czechoslovakia, Australia, and you know, a lot of places like that, they buy all summer long, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I know I know Ron's talked about that. He does the same thing. So Well, South America and Australia and all that, that's it's 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 wintertime down there right now. So yeah. they're just the opposite of us. Yep. Basically. So, so they're, they're not as big as, as our business in the United States. But it's still it's still good sales. Right. So how how many employees do you currently have at ProSlot, John? Well, um, my wife and I, we work here with three, three guys, um, Joe and Roger Cheeky and Jeremy Goenda. Joe and Roger have been working with Pro Slot going on their 25th year, and Jeremy Goenda's going on his 10th. Yeah, Joe and Roger have been here wow. 25 years. So, so I got to ask, what's it like working with your wife on a daily basis? And, and did she, was she 
familiar with slot cars or had she traveled with you to any races or anything like that? Yeah, you know, she did. When when I was doing the HO scene, um, we would have – that's all basement racing. And in this area here in southwestern Michigan, there's like 13 basement tracks all within, you know, a 45-minute drive of my house that you'll get any given weekend. Those guys are still racing. They'll get 30 guys showing up in the basement. Wow. Very organized, um, you know, I mean, just as organized as any form of racing. Um, so my wife, she was exposed to the HO scale guys. And they would come over to the house and it – that's just like it's social more than anything. So you know, there's a lot of food, a lot of fun. Um, and then when I jumped into 124 scale, I used to run around with a buddy in the mind named Mike Renegar. I don't, you guys both probably know Mike. Yeah, we know Mike. All right. Um, and when we, Mike and I would travel around, and my wife went to a couple of races with us just for fun. When we, she went to one of the Santos. She went, of course, she went shopping in Chicago. My wife lived in Chicago. For a while, so she went running around in Chicago, and she went out to New Jersey with me to a race and. She's been to Ohio with me to a couple yep. of races. So she's, she's familiar with slot racing. And, you know, she's been around it for a long time. And, of course, she's seen that track that was stuck in our basement for five years before I finally got it put up. So, <laughs> so she's very familiar with it. And working with her every day, Ralph, I got to tell you, it's, it's a lot of fun. It really is. You know, this may sound kind of cheesy, but I think our relationship is stronger now than it has ever been. Because okay. we finally have a chance to work together. And so she does, she takes care of the payables and she does all the winding on the CNC winder. She's very, she knows what the slot car game is. She's in, she makes motors now, you know, she winds them. So she knows exactly what's going on and she interacts with the guys every day. And it's really, it's kind of fun. It's kind of nice having that woman's touch around. Me, cause that's yeah, cause I, know, cause I know Dan also worked with his wife, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll work together for 30 years. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Now you, you mentioned, you mentioned your track and I saw some of the videos that you put up on uh, Facebook. When you relocated the business, you, you remodeled, it looks like you're on a main street and looks like you remodeled uh, the building and you added a track. So tell us a little bit about um, why you decided to move there, your remodeling process, your track, and, and I know I talked to Ron. Ron, you've been there before. You went to a hard body race there, and Ron said he loved it. So tell us a little bit about that, what kind of track you got, where did your track come from, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, one thing I will like to back up, though, when you told me, Ralphie, before I asked you about a paperclip because you raced on one as well. Right. You're the guy that appropriately said it's like, you know, basically it's a knife fight in a phone booth. That's right. <laughs> it exactly is. That's the way it is. That, it is fast. I mean, things come up pretty quickly. It's 107 feet. Um, you know, we that track was sat in my basement for five years. I had every intention of putting it up in my basement. And it would fit. But after I finally went through my – that was the first time I actually restored a track. I felt put tracks up, but never restored them. And the space that it takes to restore a track, to pop them up and get them on the – you know, to get them, up, get them all jacked up and to get them off the floor to sand them and to restore them properly, it takes a lot of space. So. The building that we're in right now is uh, 5,600 square feet. Um, we kind of sliced the building in half. Um, so eventually, you know, in the future, whenever I get ready to retire and sell pro slot, um, we're going to probably turn this building into two suites. And it's kind of like that. that has that configuration right now. So one suite is um, where we do all the manufacturing. We have an office that I'm in right now, and then we have a shipping and receiving room, and then we have one long corridor that where we do all the manufacturing. But we isolate um, the area where we do the, the surface grinding and the epoxy and then the powder coating. But that can be kind of messy. Yeah. So we have it isolated with a door and we have that vented properly. So that's one thing that what we did when we bought the building. The first thing I did is we had it was pretty much an open floor map. So we literally, me and the, the entire pro slot team, we sat down with graph paper and we said, how do you guys, what would, if you could make the world a perfect world for making slot cars, what would you make? And we all sat down and we did a floor plan and we laid out that floor plan and we built it exactly the way that, you know, Joe Roger and Jeremy were seeing that, that the way it really could be a lot better. So the, so the, so the materials and parts can flow in and out of the building properly. That's how it's set up now. And then on the other side of the suite, we asked where we set up, uh, we worked with Chris Daz and we restored the, the paper clip and uh, we had Chris build us a brand new 1000 foot drag strip. So we got the, we had a, our first race, the hard body race that Ron was, uh, he just floored me to see Ron come in the door. One, <laughs> Ron, thanks a lot. That was, we really appreciate you coming in to show the support to come to a you know, pro slot to race that first time. But 
Well, thanks. I mean, it, it was kind of nice to go back to Hartford, Michigan after, wow, 33 years was the last time I'd been there, basically. And nothing's changed in Hartford, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, you got a McDonald's now and a Subway, I think. But, but it was cool to go back and, and basically go back to where my roots were when I started racing. And, and the, the, your, the facility's great. Now, you won't get any tours when you go to Pro Slot. There's no tours of the factory. But, but the raceway was great. Uh, Chris Daz did a super job restoring the track. And um, with the little bar restaurant right next door, I mean, what more could you ask for? I mean, it's all right there. So parking right out the back door. So, I mean, I look forward to come up there for more events. And, you know, we'll definitely be up there in next May – or no, next March – with the Great Lakes Retro. So, and I know you've got some hard body races coming up with the Mid American Hard Body Group. So, yeah, you'll, you'll have it going on there. Yeah, we, we're going to have a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we're, we work with Chris, we store the tracks, and it was right down at it, literally the 11th hour. That term fits appropriately. We, I opened up the track on July 15th at 8.15 in the morning. And we got literally got done. Chris was putting a coat of color, coat of paint on the outside um, at 3 a.m. We locked up, we cleaned up the paint and walked out the door at 3.30 a.m. before we opened up. So I went home, grabbed a couple hours of sleep, come back up, set up the tables and chairs. We had a race that day. Made it just under the wire. Worked out really well. So. I, got re I got red paint on one of my shirts, so. Yeah, that's how wet it was. Yeah. <laughs> that's how fresh it was. <laughs> Where did you find the track at? You know, we was, I was in Ohio. And that's, it's kind of funny because um, Mike Renninger and I went down there and we got there a little early for a race. It was a retro race. Lon was there. I forget which one it was. And we, we got there a day early and Cap, we got there so early we met with Cap Henry and we were just, we had time to kill. So we, we asked Cap if he would go and show us some of the facilities that they have. You know, Cap Henry's a big one to one racer as well, a you know, sprint car racer and you know, great, great family. So Cappy was fine enough to show us around. We went to a couple of um, climate control buildings where they keep, one of them was full, just chock full of old cars, race cars, luxury cars, you name it. They have their, their, their car collection. And they also had another garage where it was more like a laboratory where Cappy put all the, uh, put all the uh, wee cars together. Literally, it was that nice. And when we were touring one of the buildings in one of the, in one of the corners, there was this track kind of propped up on its side in a climate control building. So, you know, it's stored. And I said, Cap, what's that? And he goes, oh, that's an old paper clip. You know, we're not going to set it up. I don't know if it was because of size or, you know, it wasn't conditioned because the track was in great condition. But he never really gave me a great answer. I said, what do you want to sell it for? And he goes, oh, you got to ask my dad. I literally went back to the track. I'm sitting there working on my car. And I catch Cap's dad, Kit, out of the corner of my eye walking by. And I go, hey, Kit, what do you, what do you want for that track you got? You know, laying in the corner of the building. He goes, I don't, I don't know, 1400 bucks. And I screamed out, I'll give you 1100 He goes, sold. Literally, that's how I bought that track. I went up there the next weekend. We loaded it up and brought it back. So it's just yelling across the room. I bought a track. Yep. Now, I know you mentioned Joe and Roger that worked there. And I know a lot of people know Joe and Roger, especially if they're into drag racing. And the conversation that Ron and I have back and forth a lot is, you know, I don't think most round track racers realize how popular slot car drag racing really is. Right. right. And we, we talk about that a lot. And I think there is probably more drag tracks in the country than road courses, in my opinion. I think so what what would you say your uh, like a percentage percentage or split is as far as your drag business versus your uh, road course business that's a great question um, you know I would say it's probably a 50 50 split you know um, you know it, it may be 60 40 leaning towards the drag guys there and the drag community I mean those guys use 16 D stuff a lot. There's a lot of racket racers, a lot of breakout racers. Um, the the open market isn't as big as it used to be, but it's still there. Well, it's just like wings, you know. It, it's still there, but it's not as big as it used to be. Uh, but I would say it's probably you know 50 50, maybe 60 40. Um, and that is it is a huge market. I don't know how many drag strips there are, but um, 
there, there's a lot of them, and there's a lot of guys racing them. Yeah, and, and you know, there's a, there's a lot that I use the raceway listing on slop log a lot of times for references, and as far as road courses go, it's pretty accurate. Um, but I mean, it's like weekly, uh, a page will pop up on my Facebook news feed and it's like, you know, uh, black mountain drag strip or, or something, you know? And I mean, it's just like, there's just like tons and tons of these places that are just eighth mile or quarter mile drag strip only, you know, and they're, at, they're everywhere all over the place. Well, I think in Tennessee right now, there's like five or six, uh, drag strips. I mean, I think there's a couple that are just standalone drag drag strip raceways no road course but but then you've got like uh you know tracy brown i mean he's got the drag strip and the king track and uh then you've got the, the raceway that's got the black snake and they've got a drag strip and but you know and, and while we're on drag race i mean last weekend out of buena park raceway they had the uh no glue nationals mm. and had 360 entries for that race so that's huge that was that yeah that's a pretty good size race you know so and I, and I know they raced down in uh bullet in kentucky and i think it was just a year or two ago it seemed like they had a thousand entries well i think yeah the last santa showdown last yeah the santa showdown i think they yeah, call santa it santa showdown was like 1100 or close to 1100 right yeah that's crazy it's, you know it's such a different dynamic you know i'm a road course racer and I, I never done drag racing in my life and the education and drag racing that I've had since last November has been incredible. But what these guys can do in basically a half a second or less is incredible. The stresses that they put those cars under the tires, I mean, they can they rip tires right off the rims. Right. It's just incredible what these guys are pulling down. I mean, they'll, they'll pull, we put meters on them, you know, when, when there's testing, you know, on initially, they'll pull 300 amps. And those little motors, a 16D will wow. generate three quarters of a horsepower out of the gate. 300 amps, three, three quarters of a horsepower with a 16D motor. It's incredible. Yep. You get down to the and a half a second or less. It's, you know, I don't know what the record is now, but it's you know, probably, what, 150 miles an hour? Yep. You know, yeah, it's, it's somewhere right around there, I believe, yeah. It, it's insane. You know, when you, when you talk to people about that that don't know anything about slot racing, and I can give them references to road courses, about the speed. It's hard for them to understand. But when you talk about drag racing and they're doing 55 feet in less than a half a second people understand what that is and when you snap your fingers and you say it's quicker than that and like it's right people understand what that means 55 feet at that speed is just incredible what those guys can do my hat's off to them but that's a whole different form of racing it's a whole different discipline and it's all about the setup you know, it's just incredible yep now <clears throat> something that that a lot of people are always asking Ron and myself about um, of course we always get the typical you know how do you break in your motors or, or what do you do to your motors and I know in the flexi side in the retro side you're a 4002 FK motor with the Neo mags is really really popular and it's a really good motor so if our, if our you know even if it's not a new racer just your average racer he's going to go and buy one of those off the wall. Okay. So once he gets back to his pit box and, or he takes it home and he opens it out of the bag, what can he do or what should he do to that motor to optimize the performance of it? As far as, um, is there anything that needs to be adjusted or aligned or break in? What, what would you recommend? All right. Um, um, all the 4002 FKs that come out of the shop right now, um, I touch every one of them, honestly. I go through the cases. That's one of, the, one of my duties every day is I make sure that they're – that what, what I would do, what I recommend when they get them, they, and I try to fix every one of them. I look at every one of them. I spin them all over and make sure that there's no magnets that's moved or shifted or hitting the, or hitting the armature. Very few of get out of the shop anymore. We sell those aside. Those don't get sold. Um, I look at the brushes to make sure they're aligned. So I'd the biggest thing is making sure that the, the, the bushings are lined up, you know, and just roll over so it rolls over nice and free and smooth. There's sometimes you can take them and just push down on the shaft of the motor. Just take it and just push it down on the – don't bang it, don't pound it. Just flip it over each end of the shaft and just kind of push on it to make sure that the bearing is seated into the end belt. 
And then they can't. Sometimes you can feel them when I push on them. Before I push on, you can feel them. They'll, they'll, they'll wiggle and snap into place because you know these are motors that we are importing. You know these are Asian motors that are imported. So there's a lot of variance in those. It's, it's all bit based upon the assembly. Of it. You know, of course, they're all they're all they're all machine wound. They're all machine balanced. They're all coming. The armatures all come just from the same factory. There's no magic there. Um, sometimes they come in balance, and sometimes they don't. There's a tolerance. There's a very, there's a larger tolerance that these guys have that we have negotiated with them that before we get them delivered. So sometimes you're going to get a rattler, and sometimes you don't. And sometimes rattlers are extremely fast, and sometimes they're not. So it really is a crapshoot with with the Chinese, you know, motors when we import them. But make sure the bearings are seated in, and that doesn't take a hammer. It just takes a slight push to make sure they're seated. Make sure that the brush hoods are lined up. You know, make sure that they look square. You can do that with your eye and a small pair of pliers if they're not square enough. And then I, what I do is I initially will just start to run them in. And then after I run them in, just for maybe a minute or so, I pull out, the, pull out the brushes and look at it. Make sure that you got that brush tracking in the center of the brush. And make sure that it's nice and flush along the full face of the brush, that it's not cocked, because you might, be able to, you might need to manipulate that brush a little bit. But get those brushes centered up and so you get the full line of the commutator running a nice track down the center of that brush, or close to center. And then there's a couple of options, because I've, do, I've done it both ways. We, we test it here, we put them on a dyno and on the track after testing. I've ran them in for 15 minutes, I ran them in for three hours and fully seated them. And we put them on the track and we put them on the dyno. And after I, what we've noticed is once you get to that 20 minutes to 30 minutes time frame period and you start to get a really nice seated track, as opposed to breaking them in for like say three or four hours on the power supply. Now these are with the brushes, the standard brushes. What we've noticed on the dyno, what we noticed on the track, there really isn't a huge difference in performance. There is, um, they pull about the same amperage and they still perform about the same lap times. Because I we've done it, we've tested. Right. So <clears throat> you mentioned your standard brush. What exactly is the difference between the brushes that come in? like just the Chinese type motors, 4002 FKs, and your aftermarket gold dust brushes? Yeah, the, the ones that come in initially, they're, they're a much harder compound, there's more graphite, and the brushes that we manufacture, they have a lot more copper, and the gold dust has a really minute amount of gold dust, actual gold in it. And the new brush that we have come out, it has more copper, and it's a firmer compound, more copper in, it, in the mix, and it's a firmer compound. Great conductivity on the new brush, it's really great for I wouldn't, you know, honestly, for FK motors, I wouldn't recommend the new brush. I would still stick with the gold dust. And, I mean, you think it's a little, a little too that, hard, probably? What's that, bud? You think it's a little too hard? Well, no, I don't think it's too hard. I, I, I get great performance out of the, the original gold dust brush, but the gold dust brush is soft, and it's perfect for that motor. You start running into group 12s or group 27s or high amp draw applications, um, that's when I think I like to get away from the gold brush because it wears out too quick. There's times when I've been in a race running Eurosport that I ran out of brush halfway through the race where I, won't, I don't do that when I run the new brush because it's harder. And I get great conductivity for them. It's always a trade-off, right? I mean, right. You're, right. you have to get that balance. So for FK racing, I run the gold dust brush. I run them both. As a matter of fact, the last, my last motors that I run in the hard body racing, I've been running on new brush in it because I literally, I buy my motors off the shelf, have the track motor engraved on them, I put them in a box, Brian Meharry keeps my motors now, and I just, I put the hard brushes in that, and that way I can just run those motors, you know, for at least 10 races probably. Right. So get back to the motor thing. So, um, so after I make sure the brushes are squared up and lined up, I make sure that the springs look good, because sometimes on those import springs, they collapse. So you gotta make sure, if, if, if it doesn't collapse uh, from, Compressing it the first couple of times, or running the motor in for 15, 20 minutes, it's probably not going to collapse. Usually they collapse out of the gate when they're bad. So you can just take them and flex them, make sure it's not going to collapse, because sometimes they do. The heat treating may be off on a particular spring or two. Just make sure that the springs are in good shape, and I just run them. After that, I'll put them on a the track and run them. Okay. Ron, do you remember a couple years back, maybe more than a couple years ago, do you remember the silver brushes that came out? Silver motor brushes. Well, okay. Back in the 60s, uh, there was a company called Leganki. Okay. Came out with silver motor brushes. And as far as I can tell, they were never too popular. And my first experience with silver motor brushes was in 1981. Local track had a whole bunch of old 60s stuff in a box. And 
somebody said, oh, silver motor brushes are really fast because of less resistance and this and that. So put them in my motor. I don't think I ran 25 laps and the brushes were gone. They were that soft. And I don't, I don't think 15 years of sitting had anything to do with that. I just think those brushes were just soft from the get-go. And the motors we were running then were just so many more RPM than what we ran back in the 60s or what they ran back in the 60s. It, it just, so I never had any more experience with silver brushes until they started putting silver in the RC brushes. And I remember when I worked at Parma, taking some RC brushes and cut our silver RC brushes, silver content, because they weren't 100% silver, but cut them down to fit into a Mira box stock motor and go into the track. And that motor was, I mean, a missile for, I don't know, 20, 30 laps, and then it just fell on its face and, and, and it was like the calm glazed over because of the silver brushes or something, because it, it, just, it just fell over. So I, I'm like, okay, so I took the motor back, retrued the calm, put another set in, same thing. They just, the RC brushes just weren't, I don't think they could handle the heat that the slot car motors were putting out. And then I think it was Kelly who came out with some silver motor brushes. Yeah, those are the yeah. ones I, re I was referring to. Okay, and I, and I, you know what, I, I don't, um, I never tried those because everyone said they were no good. But they but were really hard. There were some guys that swore like by them. They like, the calm out. Yeah, some guys swore by them, but most guys didn't want to run them because they said they, they weren't as fast as like the Mira Bigfoots at that time or, or, uh, because that was before there was gold dust, I believe. And that was before the Kofor Bigfoot, which is the same as the Mira Bigfoot, but, you know, Mira Bigfoot was the brush everybody run back then. So uh, the Kelly, the Kelly silver brushes never took off. So, and then they, and silver is harder on copper than copper on copper because copper is a soft material versus silver. That's why our sea brushes, they were actually low, like 30% silver content versus okay. 60. I think those Leganki brushes, if they weren't 100%, they had to be 90 because they were just pure silver in color, and, and, but they just went away. And I don't remember it hurting a commutator, but I was just like, oh, my motor brushes are no longer, and just put some stock brushes back in it and, and ran the motor. Okay. So, so just to summarize, John, so what you recommend basically doing, you want to make sure that the, both bushings are seated, make sure they're, they're all the way in, whether it's supposed to be on the can side and they're, and they're popped up in the fully seated in the end bell sign. Um, check the alignment of the hoods, make sure your springs aren't collapsed and maybe try some gold dust brushes, right? Yep, that's what I would do, and I would run them in for at least 15, 20 minutes. Um, I've seen, you know, breaking them in, fully seated works good. Um, of course, I've watched your other shows so far. Um, <laughs> I've water, I have water broken them in as well. Um, and I've seen the same thing when you water break them in. It will fill the palm slots, but usually after the water break in and they become fully seated, um, I, you know, maybe 45 seconds at the most, um, pull them out, dry them off, and I buzz them up, wrap them up pretty high, you know, Twist them up right. to nine, ten volts, and you blow all that crap out of it. You'll see some marking and some pumping. And, um, for some reason, or every time after I'd see a water dip, the amp draw goes way up. And I don't know why. No one can explain that to me. I think because you glaze the brushes. I think that's why. Yep. Amp draw goes way up. I've seen that, and you know, other people from fully seating. So, and play with spring tension. You know, don't be afraid to play with spring tension. Lighten it up. You know, stiffen it up, play with it on a track, see if you get any different results. Now, now when, you, when, when you say you take the stock brushes, are you radiusing them first? No, I just run them in. Okay, you're just running them in, okay. okay. Them from the start. Now, I'm, you know, at, at the Nats, I was shocked. I was talking to um, Chris Radish, and he said, I said, what brushes are you running? He goes, oh, the stock brushes. So I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, I don't. He goes, those, are, those stock brushes are just fine. He won the Nats with a stock pair of brushes that came with a 4002 FK. Yep. As a matter of fact, at that at, at that weekend, uh, at the another race Chris was at recently, I was pulling those brushes out, and he was a vampine and at the retro race. I was handing them my stock brushes because they wanted them to use. Oh. Some guys like them. You know, I just, I don't know why. I get better results with the build dust. 
Ron, can, can you tell us semi quickly how to change the uh, tension on a spring? Well, okay. It's, it's generally quicker just to change springs. Like, for example, the stock pro slot springs are a certain tension, and then you would go to the champion reds for a little more tension. And if you wanted more, you would go to the Coford uh, M313 spring. But if you want to take your stock springs, um, basically you have a long leg and a short leg on your spring, and the stock pro slot brushes or springs Basically, they're at three at three o'clock. Same with, same as a champion. Yeah. Same as a champion red. Same as a Coford three thirteen. If you bend the short leg down to like four o'clock, you know, with a pair of needle nose pliers and going, you know, real easy, because you, you don't want to you don't want to mess the coil up. You just want to bend that leg. Bend it down to four o'clock. You're going to add more tension. Okay. If you bend it up past three o'clock. That's lightening it, but I don't really recommend that. I think if you want to try lighter springs, pro, you've got what a ninety degree spring, a forty five degree spring, and a sixty degree spring. Correct. Okay, so forty five is this, or no? Yeah, ninety. That's, That's ninety. The acute angle is ninety. Okay, and then forty five, yep. and then sixty. And 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 what is that going to do to the motor? What is uh, increasing the spring tension or decreasing the spring tension? Pick up RPM. The lighter the spring tension, the lighter the spring tension, the more RPM you pick up. But and you'll see if you you go from a ninety degree spring to a sixty degree spring, Ralph, you're going to see probably a three thousand RPM increase. And you're going to be changing gear ratios with that. But you're but you're also going to lose brake and torques with a lighter spring, and you're going to have more heat in the motor because you got more arcing between the brush and the commutator. Right. But so again, what? again, like John said, you can gear for it. Right. So I always tend to go a little on the heavier side of tension because when you're racing and your motor heats up, you start to lose tension. So you want your motor, if you look to your motor where it starts at, like say, a three or two minute race heat, and you start at five seconds flat, in a minute you're probably going to be at 520 or 5.2 seconds. And you want to be 5.2, 5.3 at the end of that heat. You don't want to go from 4.8 to 5 to 5.5. You want to have a nice steady arc, as I call it, in lap time across the time of that heat. And, if, and you that's see, like, if you see a huge heat difference, you got two problems. You got either magnet problem, it's weak and needs to be re-zapped, or it's too weak, or, and, or you got a spring tension problem. Okay. And I think, if I'm correct, that's why you like a fully seated brush. That's why you advocate for that. Because once you get that brush fully seated, right. you know, there isn't an incredible amount of brush wear with the 4002 FKs anyways throughout right. one race. So that's when you get that consistency. Because once it's fully seated, right. you got contact, that's when that spring tension will be constant throughout that whole race. And, and like John said, like how he described how he runs the motors in for like 15 minutes, 15, 15 to 20 minutes and runs them on the track. Within a few laps, 10, 20 laps, that brush is going to be fully seated because you're pulling the load, making those laps, and it's just going to help the brush seat quicker. But your motor may run a little hotter doing it that way than if you did it on a power supply. Now, I, I noticed on, on mine, I seem to get uh, one brush seems to wear a little bit more than the other, and, and, and that's the positive side, right, that I'm, I'm wearing out a little bit quicker? Usually a negative, isn't it? Negative side, okay. It's the negative. And you know, that's funny because a lot of people say that. I don't, I've never noticed that in my personal motors. And I might use the same tension on both sides of the motor. I don't, but I don't, I, I very rarely see where that negative side brush is shorter than the positive side. I have because, well, my cars are never set up right, so I do. Oh, I'm okay. <laughs> so, so what, what causes that to happen, John? What's that? What causes that to happen? I, you're just pulling amps, man. You're pulling more amps. You're pulling more amps through either, either uh, more de deacceleration, meaning longer coast. Okay. You know, more more on the brakes, and you know, more throttle on, throttle off, throttle on, throttle off. Like, if you can if you can run your car in and go, that's going to be less than letting it coast down and then slowly get in it and take back off. So if you can go bang, 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 you're going to have less brush air. In my, you're going to have less brush wear and, and less arc and everything else. Okay, gotcha. Because you're keeping that motor spooled up. 
Okay. You got any questions for John, Ron? Um, tell us about your new um, 16D quad magnets oh, for, the, sure. for the drag racers. Yeah, um, you know, we had, uh, well, there, that's one thing that we don't really tout too much, and we really should. These are um, all sourced and made in the U.S. of A., so we're, we're real proud of that. Um, same way with all of our armatures, too, all the, all the American-made stuff. It's all made here, all sourced here, all stamped here, made here. Um, the quad magnets that we have are it's made out of our purple dot material um, that we have. It, on our meters, and all meters are relative, but Gauss is around 900, uh, in that 950 range probably, may push 1,000, but definitely around 900 on our Gauss meter. Um, so really strong, very stable. Um, what's good about this material is when you get to the, the quad configuration, when they grind it, you had, that was, that's the biggest thing when you start to make magnets. You gotta you get the stones, you gotta get the right radiuses, when you get them brown, and then you gotta move together. Um, that's where the big investment is, uh, more of that in material. It just takes time. It's the guys who put the magnets together for us. They're just like us making toys. It's you know, like making jewelry. All right. To, to get that source, it takes time. Um, but these guys did a great job because now with the quad, it, start, it, it orients the, the magnet. Because this material right here, it's basically the orientation is a straight line. But when they after that straight line, when they grind it, they orient that so it all points towards the center of the shaft of the armature. So with the right orientation, you get a much stronger magnet in the right field, you can focus the field. And that's what these quad magnets are. Um, it's the same purple dot material that we have our C cannon magnets made out of. Um, these are drop-in, um, so uh, like a racer can take our normal 16D can, pull out the magnets, drop these in, and I measured it, it's a 560 hole, so they don't have to do any honing for it, so they can run the, you know, the big diameter stuff, or they can shoot it in and they can hone it out to any size that they would want. Um, but so far, we've had great results with it. We're getting great feedback from it, um, and it's really consistent because unlike some of the stuff that we import, the grade, it's not a really high grade of ceramic, so it fades. It's great for the, for drag racers for the first you know five, six passes. You get to that ninth, tenth pass, and the bracket race in, and then they need consistency. They have to go back sometimes and hit that magnet or zap it right. so they back where it was. These here, these will last. We haven't seen them deteriorate in Gauss over time and heat. And when, and when you said they Gauss 980 or 900, whatever it was, is that in the can or out of the can? That is out of the can. Okay, so that's that's a pretty high Gauss and magnet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then in the can, is, of course, it's always much higher, but we Gauss, yeah. you get our readings, those are out of the can readings. Okay. Well, consistently whenever we get readings. Yeah. I mean, that's that's just a, you can get get the wand down there better. You know, you're not fighting inside the can on the radius. Right, but yeah, that's I mean that's a huge out of the can Gauss reading. That's huge compared yeah. to other 16D magnets. That's what I'm getting at. So we'll we'll have to get into Gauss readings. That'll have to, that'll have to be a whole different show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think you said the other day something about armature timing. Oh yeah, that's one thing we should, we should talk about is the. The relativity of armature, the timing of armatures, right? Right. Well, and, and see, that's the thing we talk about spring tension, but there's so many other things that play in the spring tension because, you right. know, air gap and timing and, and gauss and blah, blah, blah. It's, and I mean, it all comes down to a trade off, but you can go so many different doors and come out the same exit right. with all the different combinations. Right. Yeah. That's, you know, I agree. And one, we, one day we were curious you know, and, like on the Chinese motors, I wanted to know, I, because I always thought that, well, geez, you know, the, the timing on these, you know, these imported armatures, they must just be all over the place, right? No. And, uh, the the 4,000 UF Casey hats, right, that, they're set at 15 degrees. That's what the spec is. I, I literally, we, we take, we sell, now we take that FK can we have, the Poly Neo, you know, small motor, and we sell that, and guys are putting new clothes in on the racing those. We sell that too, but we tear those apart. And we have those Chinese armatures that are out of them. And we sell the cans and we load them up with American armatures. Right. We grabbed 100 one day. I literally, I sat down with 100 armatures and I just started checking them on our, we have a, we have a very precise timing fixture. Every one of them locked right on 15 degrees. There was no variance. That was, yep. it was, it was impressive. So that's, it's all, it's all numerically controlled computerized equipment making those motors. So of course. Right. Yep. Well, John, we definitely appreciate you taking your time to come on with us today. And I know all the listeners, uh, they appreciate it too. And we definitely wish you the best. And we hope you have lots of success in the future with ProSlot. 
if you want to stay on with us for a couple more minutes, we've got just two or three questions that some of our listeners have asked us from the previous shows, and I'll read off the questions, and you and Ron can give me your thoughts on them. I'd love to do that. And one, thank you for having me, too. It's been a lot of fun. Well, yep. no problem. Yep. Okay, so Kevin Palmer, he wants to know, we mentioned uh, taping on our chassis. Um, we probably mentioned a couple times on and off. So he mentioned that he races on a bank track and a flat track, and the most of the guys that he races with do, do not tape their chassis. Um, he's worried about using up uh, he doesn't have a lot of time with the track, and he doesn't want to waste time trying this. So he wants to know if this is worth trying on a bank track or a flat track or both tracks. I would try it on all tracks. I mean, I would give yeah, it a try. I, I, I mean, would absolutely. Too. I mean, it, it <laughs> takes no time to throw a piece of tape on the bottom of the, of the chassis, so time shouldn't be a concern. You should try it. I would recommend trying it. Every My experience has been um, – Every time I put tape on a flexi car, it tightens it up. And depends on the track condition. Sometimes if the if the if the track isn't good yet and I can't it, I need a little more traction, I can put a tape on it that tightens it up. I can get around the track better. If there, as the day goes on, I can take the tape off and the car comes in just fine. That's I, my my experience has been it just tightens it up. And, and, I, and I always I always have a saying. I say tape on, tape off. So like. It is so quick and simple and easy to do, especially on the bottom of the chassis. You just flip it over. I mean, it needs to be clean, but you just put it on. Don't take the body off and tape it down. And just just put the piece across the front, put it on the track, run a couple laps, yay or nay. If it's that was, that was going to be my follow-up to you, Ron, was how do you determine where you want to put it? If you want to put it on the back of the car or front of the car, it doesn't matter. Well, and I think it, well, it, depends, on the, it depends on what chassis you're running. Because some chassis have more movement in the back than others, okay? So, like, the way I run my Mazzetti cars with the back tube locked down with tape, I don't have much movement back there anyway. So, I have more movement in the front than I do in the back. So, it's pretty simple. Just put a piece of, piece of tape across the front, and, and, and you know within two or three laps whether it makes a difference or not. And if it don't make a difference, or if it's worse – take it off, run the car again. If it makes no difference and it's better, then you should probably run it that way. But now you can take a, take a piece of tape and try doing the same thing on the back of it. It's, it's, it's not that tape just works magic on the front. If that works up there, take another piece of tape and then try it on the back. Because like the Mazzetti car I ran down in FNR, I, the, the, I don't have the pin tube taped in that car. That's like the only Mazzetti car. And I put the tube in there and I put that – uh, retaining wire instead of straight pins in the tube because I, I put that car together for the LTD track at Mid-America and I wanted to leave it loose for the road course so I ran it but but the car just didn't work that good and I, I tried tape and it, it didn't work that good but I went, I went to North Carolina and it had one piece of well, I had a piece of tape across the front and the back on the track and it worked as good as anything else that was taped differently so if I hadn't put tape on that car, I would have said this car don't work because it doesn't, doesn't work with the tape on there. So, right. but you know, a JK car is a little different. A Mazzetti car is different. A JKX 25 is different from, it's the simplest, easiest tuning trick that I know of. Okay. So in the fall that up, Tom Adams wanted to know, he had some question about putting weight on cars and I know a question I get a lot is, well, how do I know if I should add it to the back of the car or to the front of the car? Well, and it also depends on if you're racing on an oval track or a road course or a king track. Right. I mean, part of leading the car is, do I need weight because my car's too light to begin with? You know, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, if your car is real light and it doesn't want to go around, are you putting weight in it? to just make it go around. And once you get it to go around, now you're putting lead in it to, to fine tune it, okay? So like, again, it depends on the track, the, the body style you're running and, and, and there's so many things. But I mean, if you're gonna put lead in your car, just put it like in a neutral spot. I would start in the middle on both sides. I'd have two pieces of the same, same length, width, whatever, thickness, put them in the center of the car and run it and see if that, See if that makes a difference. If it makes a difference 
and the track has more left-hand turns than right-hand turns, I might put a little bit more left, like if it's got more left-hand turns, I'd add my second piece on the left side of the car, probably behind that piece in the middle. Yeah. I know, I know for me, I look at weight um, and glue bores the same way. Um, personally for me, I feel like if I have to add weight or if I had to, or if I have to add glue to my tires, then there's something wrong with my car that I consider those to be band-aids. Okay. <laughs> like if that's the desperation move, that's like cleaning right. your tires in the middle of a race with lighter fluid. That's right. the desperation move right there. Or a haircut, maybe. Give yeah. him a haircut. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, so if the car doesn't work at all, if you can't drive the car without weight, you've you've got something else going on like you've got you've got the wrong gear in the car you've got the wrong tires on the car you got the wrong body the wrong guide flag set up oh, it can, and it can be the wrong tires right because if if the car wants to pop out in the front all the time and it depends on where and how and if it's a high speed turn or low speed turn yeah you might need more nose weight in the car but your tires might be too soft just giving you too much bite popping your car out on exit so, right. it, it's a, I raced for years and never added lead to my cars, but then I learned the art of tuning a car. But you, you, it's, it's always different to each specific problem. So, if you're adding weight to make weight limit for a class, put it in a neutral spot of the car. Yeah. I, I absolutely try not to add weight like weight and glue is my last resort. But if I do add weight to fine tune, like you said, um, I find for me could be different for, for everybody else. But right. if you put lead in the far back of the pan, close to the rear tires, I find that that um, makes the car tighter and create more bite. And if I put the lead like on the nose of the car, I seems like that makes the car a little bit looser to me. Well, I think that's a general rule of thumb. Put it in the back for more bite. Put it in the front for, for loosening the car up. But to me, I always felt when I put weight in the back of my car, it made my car looser. But that could be my driving style. So, again, track. No, you got to try. Right. It's an experiment. It's an experiment. And, um, John, I know you've done some retro racing. So, Jeff Bonanno down in Florida wants to know, what are a few ways or a few things I can do to make my retro car a little looser? It's tires. You know, I mean, that's what I would do. I'd look at just changing the tires. To, and that, that's one thing that I subscribe to on Paul Pfeiffer's page where he talks about, you know, hub sizes and what that does for bite. But I always, if my car is, has too much bite, I start changing my hub sizes to get a looser car. And, and, and you go to a larger hub size, right? You no, know, pulse is the larger the hub, the more bite. So you go to the smaller hub, you get rid of bite. That's okay. pulse theory. Uh, you know, Ron and I have debated this before. <laughs> Ron's been on both sides of this. But I, when I want to get rid of bite, I go to a smaller hub. And see, when I want when I want the most bite, I go to a small hub. That's how I do it too. Yeah. But yeah. but there have been days where that bigger hub has given me more bite than a smaller hub. So. I agree and I disagree with what Paul says because, again, it depends on the tracks. And, I, and, and I, I'm going to say general overall theory, smaller hub, more bite. Now, if you want to make your car looser, I would definitely go to either a harder tire or a bigger hub. Or I'd lay my rear spoiler down. Or I'd take my rear spoiler off my car altogether. But, yeah. Again, or, or lower lower downforce body maybe, or lower the rear of the body even. I mean, narrow the tires. You can narrow them. Yeah, them yeah. Up, yeah. Up a sixteenth of an inch on the inside. That that haircut again. Yep. So that's an inspiration, you know. Been at races where I thought I had too much bite, and I'm in the pits, and I get an exacto out, hook it up to the power supply, and chop off tire in between in between heats. Well, and then there's days there's days that you think you are loose. Okay, but you're actually loose because you have too much bite. Right. Because the car binds up, releases, and wiggles everywhere. So, yeah, case by case. 
All right, John, this is the part of the show where we ask Ron for the secret word of the day. Secret word of the day. What is the secret word of the day, Ron? Okay, well, before I give you the secret word of the day, I got I to gotta give a shout-out, going back to USRE Nats, to Ryan McDaniel, who posted on Facebook, Old Weird Herald, kept us up to date as much as possible on the USRE results. So okay. thanks to Ryan McDaniel. Also, Al Chuck, he posted lots of pictures, and Rich Clark. So in honor of Ryan Daniels doing such a great job, and his nickname is Vegas, <laughs> Vegas will be the secret word this, this week. Vegas. Okay. I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, thank you for tuning in to another episode. Um, please go by our Facebook page, Between the Lanes. Give it a like, comment on the video, share it, and check out our YouTube page and subscribe. And... And this week, after the show, there's going to be a bonus video. I was getting to that. Okay. Yeah. Getting to that. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. But so, go ahead. Subscribe, subscribe to the YouTube page. Like the Facebook page. And last week, we talked about Ron was going to do a video. And he's going to have that up. So after you watch the show, check the page again. And Ron's going to show us how he installs pin tubes on aluminum and anodized uh, plated pans. Chase it. Yep. Chassis pan. So yeah, that'll be up after the show's over Wednesday night or well tonight. As soon as the show's over, you should be able to see it. So yep. Yep. All right, guys, check your flags out. John, thanks again. I appreciate it. Ron. Hey John, thanks. See you guys later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.